Hi, and welcome back to The Secret Life of Parkinson's. I'm here with Brian Baker, and we have Dr. Patel with us again. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you guys? Good. We're so excited to have you back. We've gotten so many questions. So excited. <laughs> well, I mean, how many questions do we get? We do get a lot of questions. And everybody loves, you know, listening to you and watching your segments. So Brian Thank had the you. idea of asking everybody, asking the people who, who watch, what questions that they might have. Um, yeah, to get ready good. for this. So sure. I have a few things written down and yeah. uh, and hopefully we can just kind of run through and answer some. And if there's anything new that you want to talk about, just <laughs> stop us and let us know. Sounds great. Um, so this question actually did come up a couple times. Um, environmental factors. We've all heard that that's possibly like how some of us, why we have Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. um, but is, so we could talk about that, but what, People, so there were some questions about like, what is that like pre? So like if I was um, diagnosed because of environmental factors, I know mm -hmm. they can't say that. Right. Is there anything that now I should be staying away from now that I'm already diagnosed or it's like I'm already diagnosed, so it's like, ah, who cares? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because it's, you know, we're, and it's true, we, we don't know. And we've said this multiple times with the podcast that, you know, Parkinson's is, is not a cookie cutter disease. We mm -hmm. know that two, no two patients are the same. And even how patients get Parkinson's uh, is still relative. The short answer is we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, there are multiple theories out there. And one of the theories is sort of this, you know, you wonder where the Parkinson's is sort of this two hit sort of thing one hit being potentially a genetic factor. Mm -hmm. You have a mutation or something that puts you at potential risk to get Parkinson's. And just because you have the mutation doesn't mean you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. uh, and just because you have the muta mutation and you may pass it down to your children doesn't mean your children are going to get it. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is this potential that there is this gene that puts you at risk to get Parkinson's. And then a second hit happened. And that's usually probably environmental. Okay. Um, whether it's exposure to different sorts of insecticides, pesticides, exposure to various different chemicals, things like that, that now you got <clears throat> that exposure and boom, hmm. here's the disease. And But the same thing happens. Well, just because, you know, say you and your siblings, you all grew up together on this farm, yeah. all exposed to the same thing. Why am I the only one that got Parkinson's, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, it's not like, okay, everyone's exposed to it. Everyone's going to get it. Right. So it's one of those things that's unfortunately, we, we don't have a, a set sort of thing as to what what is it uh, specifically about it. And, um, you know, there are, there are certain things. I mean, I would say in terms of the question of post, should you continue it or is, does it matter? Environmental things, it's hard to say because we can't, measure these mm -hmm. environmental things you know so what's that doing for you um but i could say like in terms of like certain medications mm -hmm. right certain medications definitely can uh make someone potentially look like they have parkinson's when they don't before parkinson's and then if someone actually has parkinson's and they get exposed to certain medications that could actually definitely make their disease worse so wait, say that again. If you can, there's medications. So that... there are certain, yeah, certain antipsychotics, certain nausea medications that some of their side effects are, it makes someone look as if they have Parkinson's huh. and they don't have Parkinson's. Okay. It's, it's drug induced Parkinson's okay. is, is what we call it. Um, however, someone who truly does have Parkinson's disease and now they are, and we see this unfortunately pretty frequently, um, in the hospital, you're admitted for whatever reason, Parkinson patients are, uh, you know, you have a risk of delirium, confusion whenever you're admitted in the hospital for whatever reason. And then they give you medications because you're confused or you're agitated. And some of these meds will really make your Parkinson's a lot worse. And, oh. and we as Parkinson specialists, you know, we're always very cautious for our patients whenever they're in the hospital. Please make sure you don't get medications like Haldol, Geodon, uh, things like that. Um, and unfortunately, one of those things like, you know, middle of the night, they're yelling, screaming, or they're agitated, pulling out IVs. Uh, and the nurse calls whoever doctor on call and they just say, okay, well, you have to give them something because they're potentially harming themselves. And it's a quick, just give them Haldol, they'll calm down. 
but that could definitely really, really mess up your Parkinson's. So exposures like that kind of stuff huh. that, that's more measurable, uh, we know that for a fact um, can definitely make your disease much worse and you should definitely avoid that kind of stuff. So how, like, is there like a list of things to avoid? Most antipsychotics um, and uh, anti-nausea medications like uh, Compazine or Reglan, those two specifically, um, can uh, are, are usually the ones to, to definitely avoid. I tell my patients, you know, a lot of times if you're going to be in the hospital, sometimes it's better to just be like, hey, I'm allergic to this. Oh. You know, and, and have it there as, as an allergy to Haldol or something. So then it's going to be avoided. You're not going to get it. But that's it, weird. You know? Isn't that crazy? Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> you can't. Again, I mean, I understand because like every time you go to the doctor, they're like, are you allergic to anything? And it's right. like, no. But to say that you're allergic versus this is going to completely mess me up. Yeah. It's and, and we're working in, with Ohio Health with our hospital system to see, okay, are there potential ways in the system Can we where we could put a block? Say yeah. this person, it's listed, Parkinson's disease is listed as a diagnosis. That means this should not be an yeah. option for them to be ordered by anybody. I mean, is it the yeah. same you know? thing like with like heart disease? Like if you come in and you have heart disease, there's certain things you don't get. Right, you, you shouldn't get, right? Like if you're but is diabetic. That a, is that a thing, right, in mm -hmm. the system? But they just don't have that for Parkinson's. They just don't have that for Parkinson's, which is, know. Like, you know. That's like, and why, yeah. why is that? Where would that start at the top of like the American... Neurology Association, um, movement like disorders societies. Mandated. But the thing with the movement disorder society, you know, we're it, as movement disorder specialists, even amongst neurologists as a whole, we're not that big. Yeah, you know, there aren't many of us, so we're much smaller compared to the stroke doctors, the heart doctors, yeah. the epilepsy doctors. Even there, there's a lot more of them than there are movement disorder specialists. Yeah, you you would think there would be like a little red button or something like that. If she has Parkinson's, do not give them a yeah. And that's the sort of stuff that we're yeah. doing now in 2023 yeah. is what we're but still But only at Ohio Health. For. Right. And, and I don't know if other systems, I'm just familiar with Ohio Health. Yeah. I don't know if the other systems have something like that in place. Yeah. But, but you think I don't be, think so. Cause yeah. I, you think there would be like, that'd be coded into the the software. The, right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. The software. And, and that's what we're trying to do, that it should pop up. Like if you're trying to prescribe this for them, it should there should be a... a black box warning almost like right. this patient it says they have parkinson's you should not give this oh. um so it's it's more of that sort of thing in terms of exposure not i didn't really answer your question in terms of well no but that, I, that now i'm that interested exposure. in this side now <laughs> yeah. well because so, we've had a lot of people at the gym recently had you know going undergoing surgeries for various reasons right. and you know some of them didn't have you know a, a pleasant you know situation and I'm wondering if that was, they it, got some of the stuff and they just maybe didn't even know or didn't. Exactly. You know. And that's the thing, the Parkinson's, you know, Parkinson patients, when you are admitted in a hospital, you definitely have a lower threshold that you could easily become confused in the hospital. And, and it's just the way the, the disease is. And, you know, you're in this, A, your body's under stress because of whatever reason, whatever surgery, mm -hmm. infection, whatever you're getting done. Um, and then now it's, say you need surgery now you're going to get anesthesia you're going to be put under your body's starting to recuperate from that confusion is does anesthesia ever cause issues anesthesia i mean everyone's can be sensitive to different things it generally shouldn't cause an issue it's more of just you, your risk for anything that could confuse you it's more likely that you know there's a good chance that may happen and a lot of these anesthetics are mm -hmm. you know these are potent drugs right and and if you look at any side effect confusion is yeah right there so for sure it's you know they may wake you may wake up out of surgery and still be very confused and that's sort of the thing yeah. that can happen overnight you're out of surgery you're in the ICU and you're very confused you don't know where you are why you're here you're pulling out IVs that you're harming yourself and though someone needs to you know give you something to calm down so you don't harm yourself but then the things they give you to calm down you shouldn't be getting all right so. well the anesthesia was another question that they wanted to get into here too on this is because we've had some people go through and have had like i guess some long-term effects i guess recovering from anesthesia like the like brain fog yeah brain fog type stuff is that a common um i wouldn't say common it's it's definitely a situation where 
anything, you know, if you take, you know, someone who doesn't have Parkinson's, right, and, and their brain is functioning at, at, at this level, and then you give them anesthesia, you give them a UTI, you give them whatever, surgery, they go from here down to here, right? Mm -hmm. If you have Parkinson's and you get the cold or something, you know, you feel like shit. <laughs> that's right. Okay. You go from here to here, right? Mm -hmm. Now you take someone that has Parkinson's in their brain, so they're already kind of here, and you give them an infection or anesthesia or whatever. They're boom, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? They're going to be much, and that they will recover. They will go back to where they were. It won't be as fast as someone who doesn't have it because yeah. mm -hmm. the brain is is has this pathology going on that that it's it's just not capable of that quick recovery as someone that doesn't have that. Right. Do you recommend um, your patients, um, I know the Parkinson's Foundation has that hospital kit. Mm -hmm. do, do you recommend your patients to get that? Is Because I feel like that is something everybody it's should have. It's something that everyone, I, I yes. Uh, and I think there should always be, it's a discussion to have with your doctor and to kind of say, you know, if, hey, I'm going to be going in, if my patient's sort of like, hey, I have this shoulder surgery, whatever, mm -hmm. planned, like, you know, I we have that conversation in the cl in the office and say, okay, just so you know, there, you know, that whole peri-op period can potentially be a little bit difficult for you. Mm -hmm. During that time, do I necessarily make changes to their medications? No. Mm -hmm. The only time I would make changes to their Parkinson medications, if they're struggling, we know they're struggling because of the stress of the surgery that's put on mm -hmm. them. Um, and if, if, for example, if they have a knee replacement or hip replacement, and because they're slower, stiffer from their Parkinson's, and now that's inhibiting their ability to rehab that knee or hip mm -hmm. properly, then sure, there should be adjustments made to medications and whatnot. But otherwise, you kind of have to ride it out knowing that, okay, the most important things, especially when you are in the hospital, is, hey, I get my medications at this time, mm -hmm. th these times during the day. I need that to happen, <laughs> which... Never does. I mean, does I've not been, happen in the I've hospital. I've been in the hospital because, twice. Right, because nurses, they have, I mean, they're on their schedule, rightly mm -hmm. so, and they have their times when they give out meds, which most of the time does not correlate with when a Parkinson patient needs their meds. And But again, is this, is it, is it, oh, time to take my meds. <laughs> um, is it different for different disease groups or is it all handled the same? So like, let's say, uh, I'm diabetic or I have heart disease and you know I'm in the hospital and I get I have to get medications at certain times is it still the on the nurses time frame yeah okay but I just didn't know if we were getting slides. Well, <laughs> no, I mean, it's not, but however Parkinson's I think is different in the sense that you know dopamine is is a unique neurochemical in that it does fluctuate in the brain all day long Parkinson's patients are sensitive to when they get their medications mm -hmm. and staying as, as regimented and regulated as possible. And now you're put in the scenario where A, my disease already may, my symptoms may appear worse. B, I'm more prone to potentially being confused or whatnot because of the stress of XYZ. And now I'm not getting my meds like I'm supposed to be getting. Mm -hmm. them. Right. right? The, so I've, I've been in the hospital twice since I've been diagnosed. The one time, to the nurse's credit, she didn't know, but it's like, Midnight, and she's like, "Oh, you've only had two doses of your medication, so let's take your third dose." I'm like, no, I don't. I'm not taking it at midnight. <laughs> right. Yeah, at this point in time, you just might as well pass up because she's uh, she's not. Can you just put it in your pocket. Or, I, you know what? I don't tell the hospital. So I just <laughs> I just take my own medication there and that yeah. way. I, because realistically, because by the time they get it from the pharmacy, they get it up to the nurse. They get it to the nurse. You know, right. gets to yeah, you. It's just a lot of yeah, then it's almost time for the, the next go round. Or they may not have it. Yeah. That's another thing. There's certain meds, medications, that there's certain formularies that that's all the hospital care. There, for, I could tell you with Ohio Health, you know, we have carbidopa, levodopa in the hospital, but it's the one that dissolves because patients may not have trouble swallowing or mm. whatnot. So it's the dissolvable, it's the parcopa. That's, that's all in the hospital. So if you have Parkinson's and say you're on Riteri or you're on, mm -hmm. you know, just extended release carbidopa, uh, levodopa, when you get admitted, you're not you're not going to get what you no. usually have. Oh, God. Uh, and so you have to ha have that sort of preparation to be like, hey, this is what I get. I need you to know that either loved ones bring in the medication, say, this is their med. This is the one that they need to get. Yeah. And most of the times, you know, hospitals are accommodating to that. Mm -hmm. So, okay, well, we don't carry this, so we'll give you yours. Mm -hmm. But the nurse keeps it. The, yeah. You know, they keep it. And then... Does that mean you're not going to get it at 8, 12, 4, and 8? <laughs> yeah. You're going to get it when it's time for them right. to give oh out their gosh. meds. 
So all this to say is don't go to the hospital. <laughs> no, but seriously, I think have it's, a plan. It's, I think have that a Parkinson's plan. Foundation kit that uh, stuff like that is great to have. Yeah, a, a and set plan. and educate yourself and your family so that they can advocate for you and exactly. so that they know that you're not literally going crazy. Right. This could be because of something that they put you on that they shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. um, and it also, you know, just this is why exercise is still so important because could you el eliminate yourself from having that fall or from, you know, breaking something or mm -hmm. whatever if you're ex exercising right. properly? Right. Wow. That's a lot of... Is that... Oh, we just went on a tangent. No, oh, I know, but that was great because <laughs> yeah. I had no idea. So, like, just real quick, on those on those meds, is that, like, available online? Like, people can look at to say, like, what medications? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you could definitely talk to your doctor. They can Yeah, oh, I'm just wondering, list. too, if yeah. we just at least, like, can put the list if it's online. Mm -hmm. And I, you know... Again, this is just something that now I can talk to my husband because, like, what if I get in a car accident? Yeah. You know, it's like, I would never have thought that. And then, yeah, just interesting. Okay. Anything else on that topic? Nope. You look so excited. I am excited. <laughs> Use your, move your face. <laughs> um, okay, so that was, that was very... Like, was that was, that that was a, more was, than I, I thought. Yeah. Was that, was that question one? That was question, that was question one. one. <laughs> so we might have to skip a couple. Um, actually, the other one that I do want to touch on, um, somebody asked about the new pump that was coming out from AbV. And um, so let's talk about that. So, let's yeah, they have a, uh, there's a 24-hour carbidopa levodopa infusion. It's mm -hmm. going to be subcutaneous. Um, they don't have a lot of information. On it. It's still undergoing FDA review. Yeah. Um, so it's not... Um, officially out yet um, we're hopeful from what I've heard about it and I've uh, seen a couple of patients that are in the trials um, that have had wonderful success with it it is 24 hours mm -hmm. um, uh, the only major issues that people have come across potentially were skin stuff because it goes right under the skin. Mm -hmm. And if you're older, your skin may be somewhat more friable, more sensitive. But even with that, patients had said, they, they'll deal with the skin stuff because the yeah. the response has, has been so great. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're still waiting um, for the official uh, approval. And once we have the approval, then, uh, then we could get a lot more information as to how it's going to be prescribed, who's going to be able to get it. So yeah. there's always, that's always a struggle. Anytime something new comes out is, well, mm -hmm. you know, is insurance going to cover it? Yeah. Which ones are going to cover it? Medicare is usually a little bit more behind, and mm -hmm. most Parkinson patients are on Medicare or yeah. older. So it's always, we have to kind of, we won't have any of those answers just yet until the approval actually goes through. Right, right. Okay, so yeah, that's what we were looking at is yeah. they're going to take a little bit more time to get there, but it looks like everything's going well. The FDA just needs more information, so yeah. so that's good. Um, okay, anything that is new that has come up in your world that we might not be thinking of? or um, The newest thing and... and I, I don't know if you guys saw something like this. So the Michael J. Fox Foundation for years and years yeah. and years has been have been doing this longitudinal study, longitudinal meaning a long study where they took Parkinson patients that were diagnosed and lots of different blood samples and spinal fluid samples mm. because we don't have biomarkers. We don't have that kind of stuff yet. We don't even have an animal model for Parkinson's disease because Parkinson patients, human Parkinson patients are so different than the rat model that people mm -hmm. that we do studies on. So the foundation had done this PPMI study that was mm -hmm. looking for potential markers, and now, as of I think this was just it was just six a, a weeks week ago, yeah, a few yeah. weeks ago, something like that. That they uh, there is seems to be a alpha synuclein assay that we could run as a mm -hmm. um, more of a diagnostic thing. Uh, exactly how it's going to be applicable, it's a little bit hard to say. It's still very new. And yeah. how, what labs are going to actually have that assay. So It's going to be difficult to determine, but yeah. I, <laughs> we just went over all yeah, we, we, yeah, we did. We did there's a separate podcast on that. We, oh, okay. we went to New York and we um, learned about that. Yeah. But then we were like a lot of like, like us, we had a lot of questions of like, okay, what does this really even mean? And so I, I didn't know if you were getting any questions from your 
patience about it. I got a couple when it first came out. They were like, "Oh," and I was like, "Well, oh, oh, I mean, at this point, that? yeah." I'm like, "Well, I'm already diagnosing you. It's not going to add on anything I know. more." Um, it's it's one of those that if you're really kind of trying to figure out what's mm-hmm. going on, or you really think a patient has it and for some reason are not responding to medications yeah. that you would expect them to, things like that, then then there's there's a role for for that kind of stuff. They said it'll it, it's what it's really going to help with is speed up clinical trials and yes. and the and the and the, re, or the research. But why is that? Like what? Because now you actually have. A, if there's a potential diagnostic test, you could say, okay, well, I think I may have Parkinson's through the test. Okay, now I could get enrolled in XYZ trial. Okay. Um, so it just makes the trial that much more, like, from like an FDA standpoint, much more like for confirmed or? Yeah, and, and without having a diagnostic test, you know, a lot of, which is why, you know, we say whenever we look at these trials, you know, there's, so the way Parkinson's, research sort of happens is first in terms of animal models all the animal models are at they get injected with this chemical called mm-hmm. mptp that destroys their basal ganglia and it makes them look like they have parkinson's mm-hmm. so they're all exactly the same they all were they all were exposed to that same factor mm-hmm. right that they had that same exposure they all got the same exact amount they all got parkinson's with the same symptoms mm-hmm. and then they tested for they looked at these trials to see okay well now give them this oh they've responded so wonderful just based off of this um you know animals that you know they were given high hyperbaric oxygen whatever and like oh look they're getting better and now you try to apply that to humans when humans we're all different everyone's different exactly and so it's unfortunate with parkinson's trials there's so many that you know on paper look so promising like yes this could definitely Mm -hmm. work and then unfortunately it just doesn't translate over to human studies whenever they apply it to human studies when now if we have certain markers that we can look at like okay we actually have like there's a group of people that this is what they have this is what they're exposed to this is how they're responding huh. and we could potentially have do you think they would studies. go look back at clinical trials that didn't go well or not that they didn't go well what do i want to say or su- successful yeah that just that that had the situation that mm-hmm. you talked about would they go back and now that they have the biomarker maybe relook at those promising looking potentially on paper? yeah and maybe it's just a subgroup of patients uh-huh. that may respond to this versus mm-hmm. other group or you know group that had the lark 2 mutation or has mm-hmm. you know these this level of office nuclein they're going to respond in certain ways mm-hmm. uh now the parkinson foundation is doing that's where they're doing they're offering free um, genetic testing looking at the most common uh, potential uh, genetic mutations that could put you at risk to have Parkinson's. Right. And the idea with doing that is t- today, that information, does that change the way I'm going to manage a patient? Most likely not. Because um, we don't have anything specific for you have this gene mutation that means you should be getting XYZ medication. Mm-hmm. However, that may change the more information we get. Yeah. You know, if you have a patient and say, okay, well, this patient had this mutation, it just so happened that they they were much more sensitive to amantadine. They were much more sensitive to a dopamine agonist versus, you know, or they did really well with certain types of carbidopa, levodopa. Um, the more information we get like that, that could help in the future to say, okay, if you have you have this type of Parkinson's with mm-hmm. this mutation, yeah. so you're someone that's going to respond to this medication better. So speaking of that, um, what I was telling Brian, one of the things that we learned in New York is the there's a test for impulse control disorder. Mm-hmm. Have you heard about that? It also came from the PPMI study. It was oh. um, one of the uh, hospitals or, um, I can't, why can't I like say words? <laughs> Places in Pennsylvania, <laughs> um, and a re- researcher came in and, and spoke about the research that they're doing. I don't know if it's available right now, but huh. basically, it's you know, Brian and I were both on dopamine agonists. I did not do well. Okay. He was okay, it's as far as he knows. Mm-hmm. This question still out there. Yeah, the <laughs> but um, I, I did not care for Mirapex. Really. Yeah, but you didn't like. I actually had the impulse control. Oh, you did. Yeah, mine disorder. Just had, mm-hmm. I didn't. Have, I don't know if I necessarily had the impulse control, but mine was like just made me miserable mm-hmm. i mean just made me grouchy all the time which is different than different normal. than normal okay. yeah <laughs> I, we'll see um but no so so what they said is they there's a test now that like <coughs> before giving like for example me uh 
they could have tested me. Now they can. They could test you to see, are you likely to have impulse control disorder? I'm assuming mine would say yes. And then that way, you know, Dr. Yeah, Malone no pro- would have gone away from the dopamine right. agonist and went straight to carbidopa levodopa. So that's coming. I, I can't remember now if it's out or if it's still going through for approval. But is that, how do you guys find out about stuff like that? Through, I mean, it would it would come through potentially. I mean, if whatever lab is going to have that assay, then they would start distributing it, okay. and they would have to contact, you know, our labs, and they would come to us to sort of say, "Hey, we're offering this, mm-hmm. this, and this," and and that's okay. pretty much how. Because I mean, so I think that's to me that's huge for anybody who's. I agree. Being yeah, disgusting a dopamine agonist. It's like. It's. I mean, impulse control disorder is. It's scary. Oh, I mean, yeah. I've patients who've, you know, they've lost their retirement. They've mm-hmm. lost their homes. They've lost their marriages. Mm, that's what we were talking about. Um, yeah. f- just because of a side effect of a dopamine agonist. I know. Um, it's scary. You know, I sort of have my personal rule of thumb is if you're over the age of sixty five, you have to be hard pressed convince me that you want that I should put you on a dopamine mm-hmm. agonist. I think the older and I mean and. You guys are correcting me because you're obviously much younger and had side effects with mm-hmm. with dopamine agonists. So um, you know, I consider it for only my younger patients. Yeah, uh, my older patients, it, it would go straight to carpet dopamine. Right. <laughs> no, Jeff or Jessica sitting in the gym, like, oh, just skip the ag- just the- skip the <laughs> agonist. Like, don't even like because at the end of the day, I mean, yeah. I know every patient is different, but it's like. We're all, we all we're all going to end up on carbidopa <laughs> yeah. levodopa anyway. Right? Point. It's the very first drug through all these things we have. It still remains to this day the gold standard yeah. treatment. Yeah. And and the advantages that are coming out are actually more advantages in terms of advancing disease. So there really is, in my opinion, no reason to delay carbidopa levodopa right. in a patient. Right. right? We, we know it works. We, we know it's... Uh, uh, prior to studies like PPMI, it was the diagnostic test too. Yeah. Right? Take this yeah, and see if, if it works. works. You have Parkinson's. If it doesn't work, you don't have Parkinson's. And that's what people did. Yeah. <laughs> they still do it. They still do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's still. <sighs> so I, the one question that has come up a couple different times and that I kind of fell for some of it too is the vitamins. Like we, uh, you hear that turmeric would help with it. You hear mm-hmm. that vitamin B, vitamin folic acid, you know, I've, I've read all this stuff. Like and at the end of the day. <laughs> it's not it, and, and it all comes down to the same thing in terms of again because we do, every patient's so different mm-hmm. uh, it's it wasn't there haven't been specific vitamin stuff that have improved and that being said everyone's individual right well it's because right? it's not so, like a lot of people have to be on those vitamins for uh, not other Parkinson's reasons, reasons. Yeah. like I, I take folic acid and yeah. uh, iron Mm-hmm. because I'm just deficient in it. Yep. And same thing, like, they always check, like, my B12. But from, like, a Parkinson's standpoint, you don't see any... No, except that, just like you said, if you, so if you're deficient in it or you're anemic or something like that, mm-hmm. or B12 especially, then that isn't directly impacting Parkinson's, but it's because that's happening and that's another stressor to your body. Yeah. Now, you may present that way in terms of your symptoms looking like yeah. they're worse, and it's just that your body's deficient from the specific vitamin, so you need that vitamin, and then now you're going to feel better, i.e. your Parkinson's is going to appear mm. better. Yeah. Um, so that's Yeah, it. I mean, I know, I just know, it used, to, it, used to, it used to happen to me a lot more often, but they like, open my phone, and be like, try this cure for Parkinson's. I was like, okay, I'll try it. You know, and, <laughs> you know, and yeah, I and, did uh, get, I do get, I don't know if you guys had already touched on this, but, um, uh, the glove. Yeah. Oh, we talked about that. Um, <laughs> a, a, lot a couple of questions on that. Yeah. And the reason why we brought it up and I did some more research is, um, somebody at the gym, I guess, talked to you about it. And you said like, there's not that much studies. And then I looked back at the Fox foundation, Parkinson's foundation. I'm sure the other ones all put a letter out basically mm-hmm. after the Today Show came yeah. out on it and said, this mm-hmm. is like, just be cautious kind of. Yeah, I mean, it was it was very surprising that they went to that level to the Today Show so quickly. I mean, from what I looked up, and I could be wrong, but the anecdotal data that was out there was on like six patients. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was, they're gonna, they're doing much larger trials now, mm-hmm. but it's still very much so. In it's still early, early. Very early trial phase. Um, the results that they were presenting were on a, uh, I want to say it was like six patients. It was, mm-hmm. it was not a lot. Right. So, um, 
So, I mean, it's hopeful, potential. Um, and but so is anything. They, they've anything. talked about, like, the, the vibrating, like, you know, there's a lot of different devices out yeah. there that they've talked about that, you know, it helps, like, with your... Stimulation. Yeah, yeah, stimulation either in your toes or your fingers. So they're like, that's not new science. Right. But they're, you know, they're used, the gloves they're using to hopefully, you know, find more, I don't know, more. But, yeah, the gloves, that, that was a question that did come up a couple mm -hmm. times, but... So it's still, because it's, it's early and of course hopeful that there's something that could come out uh, promising, that's wonderful. So if there's a new gold standard, <laughs> we'll not announce it on the show, how about that? There we it go. won't be on your Facebook yeah. app. <laughs> right. We need to buy medication off of Speaking Amazon. of gold standards, I'm 20 minutes past my medication and I need to take it. So <laughs> all right. we're gonna close this up, is that good? Uh, did we get all our questions? Oh, over? actually I have another question. Yeah. Why, why does he keep tearing? I was going to ask you that. <laughs> he's been At first, I was like, are you upset? No, but he's been was... doing that for a couple of months now. Really? Like, his eyes will literally he's just started... water down his face. I think, yeah, was, I think it's... When I walked in, you started doing that. And I didn't... Yeah. He was like, he got sad, you know. <laughs> no, I just, I think I'm not blinking maybe as much or whatever. I don't know. My eyes just water sometimes now. Is no. it a new, it's a new thing? It's... It's We've more, been doing it's, it's, this for over a year, and it's been I just, more. It's coming. It's happening more often. It than, started like two months ago. And maybe I'm just, just noticing it. Maybe today. I'm just cranking up my. Are you cranking up too much? Yeah. No, I'm not. I actually came down. <laughs> <laughs> so we might need to discuss that. So yeah. teary eyes. I feel like I blink too fast, and huh. then I know a lot of people. I mean, say dry that eyes is common because you're. It's definitely a Parkinson patient have a slower blink. But he has. Yeah. But <laughs> your <laughs> excess. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know. I just, it's just, <laughs> now it's coming out even I know. Now, now you brought attention to it. Now it's even... <laughs> but and it's um, just tears because you don't have drooling. No. It's common. Yeah. Like I said, when I saw my opt optician, I've seen her a couple of times since I've been diagnosed. And, you know, the, her, her, I asked her if my eyesight had started to go bad where I had to get bifocals. And I asked her if it was Parkinson's Aww. related. I know. <laughs> Though and she and she, said, she told me the same thing. She told me that, you know, she couldn't definitely say that it was Parkinson's related, but your eyeballs do have dopamine receptors. Mm -hmm. And so if there's not enough dopamine in your system, that it could be an impact. And then when I saw her this last year, a couple months ago, she said that I was not, even when I was trying to close my eyes. It wasn't fully. It wasn't fully closing. And she said, that's definitely Parkinson's. You right. really don't blink. I've been looking at you for, yeah. <laughs> wow. I'm sure that has something to do with so it. So I think that's maybe why you're tears. You need to blink, blink, blink. <laughs> blink. <laughs> <laughs> but well we appreciate you coming in, Dr. Patel yeah. thank, thank you guys so thank much. You so much my pleasure in our last 30 seconds I'll leave you with this as we talked about if you're going into the hospital or even before you have that situation happen make sure that you do your due diligence talk to your family members get yourself a Parkinson's hospital kit that you can get through the Parkinson's foundation um, it's really important to take care of yourself and be your own advocate even when you're in situations like that um, if you have any other questions that you'd like to share, please uh, comment, subscribe, and we'd love to have Dr. Patel come back on again, and hopefully we can learn a lot more. Thanks for tuning in.